let's turn over to Ephesians chapter number 6, and I'm going to read verses uh, 10 through 17. We're actually, in the next two weeks, going to get into the uh, armor of God here and uh, have a good time with it. Now, verse 10, chapter 6 of Ephesians says, Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, strategies, the trickery, whatever word you want to put in there, of the adversary or of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of the wickedness in the heavenly places or in the celestials. <coughs> Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you were able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you that you make available to us as believers in this wrestling match that we have with these beings that you've mentioned, uh, your armor, and that you're willing to share it with us if we're willing to put it on and partake of what you have. Now, Father, this, this great battle is, is going to take place for a number of eons. And Father, we want to be prepared for it, so I pray to bless uh, this message, the studies we've been doing here, that our hearts and minds would be ready for that evil day. And we'll thank you for that in Christ's name. And amen. Now, Paul had an understanding that most believers never come to in their lifetime. Turn with me to 1 John chapter number 5, and let me uh, uh, give you this. Okay, 1 John chapter number 5. And verse number 19, where it says this, verse 19, chapter 5 of 1 John. We know that we are of God. Are you of God? Yes. yes. Amen. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the whole world lies under the sway of whom? The evil one. The evil one. That's why we've been talking about Paul penetrating the darkness over the last two weeks. He penetrated the darkness that we saw last week with what? Uh, light. light. All right. And what kind of light was it? Or is it? Diffused. It's diffused light. Just like the light back in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 3. It wasn't the full light that comes forth from the throne of God. But a diffused light because a diffused light will not destroy everything. See, men cannot come into the presence of God. It says so right in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Christ dwells in the light. The Father of lights, uh, James records for us, and no man has approached unto, you see. And so we understand that, that you and I have the light of Christ within us, and as a result of that, that light is diffused. But that's good, because if the light was the pure light of God, what would happen? It would die. Everyone would die, see. We can't stand in that light. But notice this, we lie, or we live in a time, and that time has been since Adam and Eve, by the way, that is controlled by the God of this world. It's an evil time, it's a dark time. But Paul, in, in, in his lifetime, penetrated that darkness to different places around the Mediterranean Sea and, and, and brought forth the light. So I know this, that Paul's heart desire was to be used as God's agent to rescue men from the darkness, bring them the light, see? He manifested, and I, I don't think this is a stretch when I say this, he manifested a love toward men that's unparalleled in the history of mankind except for Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul took that light out, and who would know? I mean, would Paul have known uh, when he wrote Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Colossians, Thessalonians, and, and the personal letters that they'd still be in existence 2,000 years later? No. no. Probably not. But yet, there they are. I think that Paul's gone, you know, he, he wrote in... Colossians chapter number one, that, that his desire is to present every man perfect or mature to God. So he had some inkling of what was going to happen, but I don't know if it went beyond his generation or not. Right. But can you imagine the surprise that Paul's going to have in the resurrection day when everybody lines up behind him and he presents us to the Lord? 
I mean, here's this little Jewish guy yep. <laughs> that suffered mightily. And do you realize almost every book he writes has that, mm -hmm. what I suffered for you? Yeah. I suffered to fulfill the afflictions of Christ in you mm -hmm. and those sort of things. So Paul knew what it was uh, to suffer. But he had a great desire for people. Notice with me Romans chapter 10, please. Romans chapter 10. Let me just give you a couple verses here. Because as we go through this, I myself have grown, I believe, to a place where I can say I love people. I've never been like that. I mean, it took me a long, long time. Uh, I wasn't raised that way, you see. And, and, you know, you might call it a prejudice, a fear, or whatever you want to call it. But as, as, as the gospel penetrates you, and you begin to understand that the gospel goes beyond getting saved, that we're saved daily, our salvation is a daily salvation in our growth towards Jesus Christ and our relationship toward Him and the Father, you see, we learn to love. And, and that's what this thing is all about. And that's what happened to Paul. I mean, when Paul gets saved, who did he love? He loved his own idea of defending Judaism, which wasn't God's idea, was it? So he had to learn to love people. And so he is our example. So in 10.1 it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they may be what? Save. They might be saved. And then I come over to 1 Corinthians, if you would. Just two verses here. Chapter number 9. Now I'm going to go to chapter 10. Chapter number 9. And notice, please, verse number 22 where it says this. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might be or might by all means save some. So that's his heart desire. And that grew in him. It wasn't natural. There's nothing natural about love. Love has to be learned. Love has to be cultivated, you see. And, and that's pretty hard to do, you know, apart from Christ. Notice chapter 10 and verse 33. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be what? Same, same. Therefore, when you get to Timothy, Paul, Paul says this, man, I suffered for the sake of the elect. His desire is to see people come into the light, to walk out of the darkness. And he, isn't he the one that wrote to us and said, we've been translated from yeah. the kingdom of what? His dear son. It, uh, darkness into darkness the kingdom of his dear son. son. Say? So it's a, it's, it, to me, it's a wonderment. So Paul's exhortation then in Ephesians 6, 3, uh, 6, 13. Come on over back there, and I'll settle down right here. Where he says in verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to do what? Stand. To stand, okay? Uh, to stand. So his exhortation, take up the whole armor of God. So this exhortation that we see in verse number 13, the question I have is this. What's the source of the imagery of the armor or the full Im implements that God has in order for us to stand in, in that evil day, in order for us to wrestle against these principalities and powers, against the, the, these evil powers that, that rule? Say, what's the imagery? Where did Paul get it? Okay? Well, there's differing opinions on this. I always used to say it was the Roman guard that was chained to Paul. And you can see in verse number uh, 20 of our text here, for which I am ambassador in chains. Mm -hmm. Chapter 6 and verse number 20, okay? Chains. But the guard, if you think about this, wouldn't have a shield. No. Do you ever think of that? Uh, did, you know, did anybody do any homework on this at all? Okay. How big was the shield that the Roman soldier took the battle? As big as a door. Big, almost as big as a door. They were four foot high. Two and a half foot wide. And, and how would you like to carry something like that around all day? Yeah. I mean, they were covered with leather. And we'll talk about that more next week and get your, your, your thoughts on it. But, but they were huge. But they weren't made for personal protection. They were made Depends. for everybody's protection. Because mm -hmm. what they did to lock them together. Mm -hmm. See? They locked them together. And, and, but the guard didn't have that, you see. He would have no shield. Uh, and verse 16 says, but, but take this shield of faith. All right? So obviously, he didn't get the imagery from the guard that he was chained or handcuffed to there as he was a prisoner in Rome. Uh, the second idea is this, that a lightly armored fighter 
Well, in the Roman army, a, a lightly armored uh, uh, fighter was equipped only with bows and arrows. And that, that, that doesn't come anywhere near, okay, uh, uh, fitting the symbolism of Ephesians chapter 6. So when we come to the third idea, I think this is where we're going to camp here, the Roman warrior, okay? Greek, the Greek historian Polybus, P-O-L-Y-B-I-U-S, Polybius, okay, good enough for me. He says that the Roman warrior had a shield, a sword, two javelins, a helmet, greaves. What's a greave? Anybody know? Probably a shin guard. Maybe. Shin guards. Thank you, Miss Haley. I had to ask her a couple of days ago. It wasn't in my dictionary anywhere. I couldn't find it. Okay, greaves or shin guards, and they had what they call the heart guard. We call it breastplate. Breastplate. Okay. That sort of thing. Now, what we understand is the two javelins and the greaves were not mentioned by Paul. But it follows the general direction of the apostles' thinking, okay, that we see here. Now, remember, we're looking at the imagery of this. We used to have a picture of our, our Roman soldier on the back yeah. there. I couldn't find it. Save my life. I want to put it up. And so you can visualize this because if you can visualize it, it helps you understand what God's talking about. Because he, he, he gives it to you in a certain order, you see. And I'm going to share that order with you, and hopefully you'll have some thoughts on that next week. And, and then it'll, it'll probably take more than one week to go, go through these things, okay? So we have then a metaphor, is what we have, which is influenced by Paul. Now watch this and get a hold of this. Because even the javelins don't fit the pictures, the greaves don't fit the pictures. But in the Old Testament, we have some metaphors concerning God himself. And I think that's where Paul pulled the imagery from. And let me share that with you here for just a few minutes. Okay? Come first of all back to Isaiah in chapter number 11. Okay? Isaiah. Old Testament. First of the prophets, right? First of the writing prophets here. Isaiah chapter 11. Notice the first five verses here. This has to do with the reign of Jesse's offspring. I wonder who that is. Okay. I mean, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, verse 11 says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins. When we talk about loins, we go. Between the lower part. The okay, lower part. Yes. From your waist down. Up in the in there. Okay. So righteousness shall be the belt of his loins. And the belt is very important. What hangs from a belt? The sword. The sword does. Okay, a sword does. And faithfulness, the belt of his waist. So there is a picture, see, that Paul brings forth into the, in, into the New Testament, into the this business of, of the, the full uh, employment of the armor that God has for us so we can stand in that evil day considering who we're wrestling, okay? Then we come over to Isaiah 49. I have a number of them here, not all of them. Uh, Isaiah 49. Uh, did you know that, this is interesting, I, I get a kick out of certain things when, when I study. The word shield appears 45 times in scriptures, okay? Uh, <laughs> most of the time in the book of Exodus. The word shields, plural, is 22 times, okay? The word sword, 424 times. The Lord ever take, tell, a, to tell a saint of God to take up a sword? Yeah, he did. Yes, he did. Told the apostles. Yeah. Yeah. You take up the sword because you're going to need it. But it's not a, it's not a literal sword. A literal sword. 
Okay. And we'll look at that when we get to it. Okay? There's going to be a time when it's necessary to defend yourself, so take up a sword. Okay? Uh, 424 times. The word swords, plural, appears 24 times. Helmet, only 8 times. And breastplate, 28 times. Now, what's interesting to me is this. That the word shield only appears once in the New Testament. That's in our text. Okay? Sword appears 31 times. Uh, helmet only appears twice. Once in Ephesians, once in 2 Thessalonians. Okay? And breastplate only twice out of 28 times in the whole scripture. So, so the bringing of, of this picture of armor, the armor is found in the Old Testament, it's brought forth into the New Testament, but then on a spiritual realm, because our, our battle is with these celestial beings. Now we're in chapter 49, right? Right. Okay? Now watch verses 1 and 2, then 5 and 6. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother's, uh, my mother, he has made mention of my name, and he has made my mouth like a sharp, sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me, and he made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. In his quiver, he has hidden me. Then we come down to verse number five, and now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, is it a small thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of what? The ends of the earth. So up there in verse number two, he talks about a sword. And what is the sword equated to here? The word. Now, what are we going to find in Ephesians? We're going to find the same principle applies there. Okay, now, the word, and you're going to find this. Now, hang in here with me. The first four things that we're going to find in, in, in Ephesians chapter six about these implements of warfare are we have to take them on. The next two are gifts of God: the sword and the helmet. And, but we'll talk about that later, okay? Talk about that later. Next, come to chapter 59. Just letting you know where Paul's getting his imagery from, okay? I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ went out of his way not to battle with those on earth. Did he not? Yeah. In fact, he told Pilate that my kingdom's on of this earth. If it was, I would have called my angels and you'd all been gone and I'd set up my throne, say, which will happen someday. So we see verses 15 to 17 here in chapter 59. <coughs> so truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a... Breastplate. As a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garment of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Speaking, all, all these are speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? The Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm going to turn back to Genesis 15.1. Don't go back there. I'll just read this to you real quickly. Okay? Uh, if you want to, come back to Deuteronomy 33. In 15.1 of Genesis, it says this, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your... Anybody know? Shield. Shield. And your exceeding great reward. So again, the imagery, right from God himself, Old Testament. So Deuteronomy 33, I watch what it says here. Very simple what I'm sharing with you this morning. Deuteronomy 33. Okay. And notice please verse number 29. Where it says this. Happy are you, O Israel. Who is like you? A people saved by the Lord. The shield of your help. Just like he told Abraham. And the sword of your majesty. Your enemies shall submit to you. And you shall tread down their high places. So again, you see the imagery of what? A soldier's Roman soldier. gear, say, implementation. Now finally comes Psalm 3. Wait, Psalm 3. 
Psalm 3. Notice verse 1, please. Lord, how they have increased to trouble me. Exclamation part. Point. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who slay or say of me, there is no help for him in God. When did that happen? In the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the cross. Say law. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. So if we see this imagery in Ephesians chapter number six. What are we seeing? We're seeing these parts of armor that God himself has said, it's me. He equates it all to himself, and we know it to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, you got that? Now, Paul took this to heart, because I know some things, uh, and so do you. First, first Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, now watch this. I have just three verses here. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And notice with me, please, verse number 8. 5 eight. But let us who are the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, there you have a breastplate, and you have a helmet. Mm -hmm. Now, this helmet differs. This is a hope of salvation. In Ephesians, it is salvation itself, okay? In Ephesians, it's a breastplate of righteousness. Here, it's of what? What's it say there? Faith, hope faith, and, love. faith and love. Okay, so you have faith, love, and hope here. Mm -hmm. all, all together to these uh, dear people. So Paul continues this in his, his writing to people. So when I come back, 6, 7, 2 Corinthians. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Can you, can you catch all this? Mm -hmm. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, uh, listen, if you go to war, <coughs> you don't go at your own expense. Okay, we'll bring that up next week. So when we go to war, it's not at our own expense. Who, who's paying for all this? Christ, Christ has already paid yeah. for all this. Yeah. Say, and it's sitting there. I don't know if you realize this. When the, when the Roman armies marched to war, they didn't have their javelins and their spear and their and their uh, swords, and very few of them had their shields. Can you imagine? I mean, how far did they? Just from Rome, and actually, the Roman army never went into Rome. That was against the yeah. Constitution of Rome, so they were on the outskirts somewhere. But if they had to go from there to Spain or there to Turkey, or that's a long hike. Yeah. They didn't have Humvees and all that back then, so they had to walk. So where was their shield and their swords and their javelins? They were in wagons. Mm -hmm. And they didn't take on those things the until battle. they came to the battlefield. Because yeah. they'd be exhausted. Yeah. Sure. See what I mean? They'd be exhausted. So with you and me, the armor is available. <laughs> it's sitting right there, and God's ready to what? This is the battlefield, folks. You take it. Yeah. See, that's what we have to remember, all right? Finally, come over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 2. I just want to give you the imagery this morning. That's all I'm doing. So we come next week, and we start talking about the individual parts of it, okay, as, as we go through it, and get your ideas on it, and then, then I'll give you what I've studied on it. Uh, I think it'll be a blessing to you, okay? And to me, you know what it is? It's exciting. Yes. It's exciting. Yes. You know, when I was in the, in the military on the, on the ship in, in New York, um, the Navy paid, I was in the Coast Guard, the Navy paid for everything on that ship. Okay, on our, on the, and our main uh, uh, occupation on that ship was, was to be, believe it or not, uh, a beacon for airplanes going back and forth from Europe to America, and America to Europe, and, and to Africa, or, or wherever. We had ocean stations that, that the nations of the world, some of them, uh, the NATO nations, uh, kept 10 by 10 square uh, miles, and we had to be in a certain square at a certain time uh, for a flight coming over so they could beam down on us and they could get their, their bearings. Now today, you don't, you don't, they don't need that because of the electronic, they use satellites now. Yeah. But we used to carry torpedoes, okay? We had a five inch mount, which I was captain of, 
And, and uh, I mean, we had that armament. The torpedoes were for not ships, but submarines. Mm -hmm. Okay, because our, our ship was 370 feet long, only 32 feet wide, we could turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. And what happened, so the Navy used us then to be the out the screens on convoys. Mm -hmm. And if there was sight of a submarine, then we'd go seek it, that, that kind of stuff, you know. The first submarine sunk in the, in the Second War was done by a Coast Guard vessel. Mm -hmm. Do you know the name? I do not. <laughs> uh, the Spencer. Okay, and, and it was still in use when I was in 1971 through 75 when I was on, or 73 when I was on the ship in New York. But, it, but what I was saying is this, you know what, the daily routine on the ship was kind of boring. You had a job to do, you did it. But as soon as the clanger went off, general quarters, things got exciting. You know, something's happened, no matter what it was. I mean, it wasn't always war, you know, rescue or, or whatever. And, 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 and that's how I perceive this that we read about in Ephesians chapter 6. God's asking me and you, body members, to get excited about what's going on in his realm. Yes. We get excited about everything in this earthly realm, but the heavenly just seems to be... Yep. And, and what are most Christians waiting for? A harp and a yeah, crumpet. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they're waiting for. Yep, yep. They don't understand that when's your rest going to come? No. I would say never. Only when you're in the grave for that short period of time. <laughs> <All right. laughs> That's the German thought for that short period of time in the grave. What did, at the consummation. At the consummation. Say, when God is all in all, that's the rest. We're going to be laboring all through here. Say. Now let me say a little thing. And, and, and this is not political. But Benjamin Franklin once said this. Yeah. Uh, but in such a way that they can keep their dignity. Yeah, there you go. Amen. And you know what's happened in our country? No dignity. No dignity. Turn no around. Yeah, just just give, give, give. You know. And Brother George was telling me once when he was first married, and, and uh, his his wife was on welfare, she had to pay that back. Yeah. You used to. Yeah. Yeah. He had to pay that back. Yeah. Why? The dignity of the human. Now watch. Where is because we're going to do a little study in Sunday school about women and how God views women in our in our studies of God's character mm -hmm. and the openness of God, okay? And where is the most, in Christianity, is where women are what? Okay. Dignified. Dignified. Yep. Mm -hmm. Dignified, okay? Now I'll give you some thoughts on that. But it's, it's, it's a wonderment to me that God's desire is for me and you to take on this armor and be part of what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Isn't that exciting? Yes. It should be exciting. Okay? Who are we fighting against? I don't have to fight about anybody in the government, anybody in another country. No, my fight is with what? Spiritual beings. Spiritual beings. Yeah. This whole world lies in what? The evil one, the wicked one. It lies in darkness. And so the whole world is set up to draw me where? To darkness. As a believer. See? It's only when you take on that armor and have that realization that you stand in the light. Mm -hmm. He doesn't tell you to run with it. He just says stand. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because it's pretty hard to run with all that armor. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me just say that to you. Okay? Now I have to turn to 2 Timothy in chapter 2. Watch verses 3 and 4. Okay? 2, 3, and 4 here. It says this. You therefore must endure hardship. This is why we don't want the armor of God. See? We don't want to realize that the real battle is taking place is spiritual, not physical. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one entangles in warfare, entangles himself with the affairs of what? This world. Get hold of that, this life, that he may please him who enlists him as a soldier. If you get entangled with the affairs of this life, you're not going to please the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that drafted you. Okay. I mean, that's why I ended up in the Coast Guard. I got one of those letters in the mail when I was in college at Edinburgh, Pennsylvania. Greetings! <laughs> <laughs> From your government. Please report to the Erie, uh, Erie Pennsylvania, uh, courthouse on June 5th, 1967. Don't plan on coming home again. <laughs> one of, one of those things. Okay. So, here we are. Again, the imagery of what? A soldier. Where does Paul pull it from? 
Old Testament. I believe the Old Testament from God Himself. Say from God Himself. So what have I learned today? You guys ever listen to Dan Beck? To who? Guys, are you a guy? No. All right, pay attention. <laughs> okay. Well, guys could mean guys. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, guys yeah. mean oh, men. Oh, you gentlemen, okay. does anybody here? I like Dan Patrick. Uh, I listen to him on a radio when I travel. But at the end of the show, it's a radio show, a couple hours every, every morning. And uh, at the end of the show, he has four gentlemen uh, with him, you know, that run the place. And, and he, he lets them on. They talk back and forth. He says, all right, fellas, tell me one thing you've learned today. And he goes through all four of them. Okay? So let me ask you, what did you learn today? That the imagery of Ephesians 6 was brought forth from the Old Testament and something that God himself kind of puts on. Oh, okay. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Keith is pondering over here. So. The Lord is on armor. The Lord's our armor. Number one, our Lord put on his armor. Yes. Okay? Therefore, Paul put on an armor. Mm -hmm. Paul followed Christ. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the body of Christ needs to put on the armor because we follow Paul as Paul followed Christ. Christ. Okay? We bring light, and that's the only way it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. We put on the armor. We'll begin, as Paul did, to penetrate the light that we've talked about over the last two weeks. Yes. As we put on the armor, the darkness will be penetrated. Yeah. Exactly. Remember I said this a couple weeks ago? Light attracts what? Bugs. Bugs. Insects. Flies. Insects. <laughs> it, it, it attracts bugs. That's right. We're told to stand mm -hmm. with the armor. It's a diffused light we talked about last week. But it's not like you have to go to the ends of the earth. You just be a light and you'll attract. Amen. Amen. Say, You'll attract those, and they'll get out of the darkness. That would be their desire.